Before I start here, I have to take a second to address any Rush fans who may have clicked on this video because of the fact that this is a Rush-centric video coming out nearly after the passing of Neil Peart, the drummer, who just died today. And I have to tell you that this podcast was recorded about a week ago. I, the, At least the segment that talks about Rush was recorded at that time. Um, you know, having no idea that Neil Peart was going to die, obviously. So, finding out about it just on the day that I planned to release this, I figured it would be important for me to sort of address this fact in the podcast in some way. Um, you know, the tone of this podcast is not, like, reverent. It is not in the wake of someone's passing. However, it is a celebration of of Rush, and particularly of their lyrics, of the song Hemispheres, and uh, I also examine the song The Trees, I ask some questions about it, I think ultimately I, uh, you know, I come down on the side of being, like, pretty favorable towards Rush and their lyrics, um, even as I question some of them, so, you know, I just wanted to say all of that because while I still think that this is kind of in a strange way, a tribute to, um, you know, to the death of Neil Peart. Um, it nonetheless had no intentions of being that at all. So keep that in mind if you listen. And uh, I'll be putting that segment at the front of the podcast. It originally would have been the second segment. But for any of those of you who are interested in hearing me talk about Rush, even knowing this context... Um, you know, I won't bore you with the rest of this unrelated podcast. That stuff will come later. Anyways, thank you for listening. Okay, so I just thought two of the funniest thoughts to me that I've ever thought. Because I was just listening to the song Hemispheres by Rush. And the whole song is all about this war between the gods of love and reason inside of the brains of the, of the people, right? And in the end, they achieve balance. And at the very end of the song, like, there's this, this, like, spirit is born of the balance that they have achieved and takes form and becomes the god Cygnus. And they literally say, like, in this epic choir at the end of the song, We will call you Cygnus, the god of balance you shall be. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, Cygnus, that's a pretty cool name. And then I realized that if we were in the 70s, undoubtedly, I would demand that you named our first son Cygnus. And then I lifted him up and said that line, We will call you Cygnus, the god of balance you shall be. And raised his baby to the sky and tried to raise him as the god of balance, a perfect concoction of love and knowledge. Uh, a, a, a single perfect sphere of a human. I would have definitely done that. And also, there's a Mars Volta song called Cygnus Visman Cygnus. So, even today, I still think it's a good name. But I would not name my kid that because I know that I will hold him up and think in my mind that rush line. And then I'll feel like, uh, like a displaced in time because it's not my generation. Rush is my dad's music. You know, I don't even listen to Rush anymore. I listened to it when I was a kid. Um, I still like their songs, but they're they're kind of cheesy. They're not like the kind of music you really just have on in the background. Really, you kind of got to be like paying attention. <clears throat> and they're telling these like uh these like fables, you know, these metaphorical stories about about like what it really be like though. And uh, you know, and like the 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 ending of Hemispheres has. Getty Lee playing this, like, solo acoustic guitar, like, very, like, you know, we are the world, like, ballad where he's singing about, like, you know, if love was the answer, we could all come into one perfect sphere. And it's like, he's kind of, like, you know, winking and nodding and, like, talking to the audience directly, like, yes, this fable could teach us all a lesson. This story we've told today could truly, you know, uh, br make the world a better place. You know, it's a little on the nose is what I'm saying. I like the lyrics. I think it's it's a clever ending with the single perfect sphere line. Oh, you get a picture of Earth in your mind when you think about it. Oh, of course. It all makes sense. It's a story about our people. So, uh, the other funny thought that I had is that there is, 
like a 98% chance that when you are giving birth to my first child, as I see the head crowning in my mind, unavoidably, I will be thinking, So take a and uh, that I can't help. There's no turning that off. That's just my brain goes to that when anything exciting happens. I don't think it played in my head the first time that I had sex, but that's probably because it was a weird experience. I was too busy thinking about Ludo narrative dissonance for some reason during that in- encounter. Anyway, so I wanted to talk about Rush and hemispheres because I was thinking about it and uh, I've been fascinated for like over a year now um, with the the dynamic of the left and right brain you know it's not an exact like you know left and right dichotomy there are multiple parts of the brain but this idea that there are parts of the brain which um, are in control of sort of your creativity, your, uh, you know, actual, like, feelings, and, like, that there's another part of the brain that's just dedicated to language, and that the, the, the part that is in control of the feelings does not have speech. The language center translates those feelings into speech, and thus, while these are all working together as one mechanism, there's this this feeling that I think all of us have, that there's like another person inside of our mind who is the real us, and that the one that we portray, the one that we talk to other people with, is like an attempt to communicate that real us, but it never meets the mark because they're all so different from one another that there's, you know, we only really connect on the broad similarities. And that's why, I mean, this is entirely the definition of why, like, broad versus niche entertainment is a thing. Like, broad entertainment appeals to everybody's sort of, you know, universal sense of self, but your particular inner true self built out of your experiences and your feelings that can't necessarily be put into words can be expressed in other ways and that's a way that it connects with people and words incidentally are still like the most powerful way by far that things connect with people because they have so much precision and you can really control the precision of your words to where you can make something vague and precise at the same time. You can present something that is, I mean, like, think about the lyrics to uh, The King of Carrot Flowers, you know? Like, you can tell what he's describing, but they're very poetic and indirect, and so you have a more emotional sense of the scenario than a literal sense of the scenario of what's going on with these characters and their lives so you know that is the the power of words to be abstract like music is and to help give context to the extreme abstraction of music that we're more likely to in not recognizing what it specifically is meant to convey merely pick up on the elements that we relate to and then project our own feelings onto and so and a lot of music is intended to be projected onto I think a lot of musicians when they say like our music is meant to be open to interpretation what they're trying to say is like if I tell you what I think it means, you are not going to think about what it means to you, and I want you to think about what it means to you, because music that reaches people has that broad appeal. I mean, something like Linkin Park, you know, every fucking song is extremely vague, extremely broad, very easy to project onto, very easy to relate to, and that's always been the key to their success, you know? If you listen to the song Numb, like, it could mean so many different things, and, you know, a lot of the times these songs will use their music videos to just give, like, an interpretation of the song, but often one that's so far removed from, like, what you would think of that it really makes you realize how many different ways it could be interpreted, you know, if you see something that's like, huh... You know, I didn't think about how this song could reflect this theme. Popping into my head is like, float on by Modest Mouse. You know, like, the music video is just like sheep going into a slaughterhouse. And uh, in this this particular weird aesthetic that matches with the sound of their music really well. And it just makes you feel like, huh, yeah, I mean, this goes with the song somehow. But uh, it's definitely not what I was picturing when I listened to it by myself. 
So anyways, in light of the fact that I think about this, this sort of brain dichotomy a lot, I also think there are people who really like value and prioritize like one side of that over the other. There are some people who really, you know, prioritize the, the, the true self that's at the core of their brain that they see as like this, you know, they need to protect it, they need to express it, and it needs to have freedom. And then there are other people who sort of see it as like, we need to all be beheld to like a certain logical formula. And like we all are in society. And this is why a lot of the more emotional people are the ones who really like are out trying to like challenge societal norms and you know get people to accept different things because they really want that side of them to be you know to be free whereas there are many other people who are deliberately subduing that side of themselves and trying not to understand it and I think you know a lot of the people who I mean on both sides of the spectrum these lead to insanity you know like if you get too lost in your own emotions I've seen people go uh, you know, go out in depression because if your emotions are negative and you're indulging in them, you uh, inevitably will, you know, lead to suicide. This is why, like, one of the main ways out of depression is discipline. And it's very hard for a more emotionally driven person, I think, to develop that kind of, like, logistical discipline that deliberately hampers their self-expression, deliberately puts that in the backseat and, you know, says, let's do what I have to do to survive and to make it in society. And then there's the people who are really driven to, like, you know, logic their way through life. And I, I think you see a lot of, like, these politicians and lawyers and people who end up in, like, these weird, illicit situations, abusing power and doing all this, like, crazy fucked up sex shit, basically because they are constantly repressing this emotional side of their brain and, you know, just trying to, like, find a way to fit it logically into this, like, power structure they're they're building for themselves so you know these are both ways you get lost in the weeds and you might be thinking i'm kind of talking about people who uh tend to fall into two sides of a certain political spectrum here and also you know two sides of maybe even an age spectrum here um i'm starting to think maybe that there's a lot of division going on in the world you know based on the way that people feel about their brains and this is what hemispheres is about the song hemispheres by rush is about the conflict between um the gods dionysus and apollo the gods of logic and emotion essentially uh i don't think in that order though um and each of them is basically trying to lead the people of like a i guess greece because it's supposed to be th those are greek gods right yeah so they're leading the people of greece um, into civilization, essentially, or trying to, trying to take care of them. There's, there's a big battle that's fought, I think, at the start. Th forgive me for not being completely clear on the details. I didn't bother rereading the lyrics to this, and I haven't read them in 10 years. I'm sure I knew the whole story at some point in history. But basically, Dionysus and Apollo each try out their own ways of leading civilization. And when they are led under just logic, they're able to, you know, build civilization well, uh, nobody's starving, everything's going good, it's a well-oiled machine, but people feel no drive. They feel no particular reason to continue this society because they're like, well, what the fuck are we doing this for? Like, what's the point, ultimately? And so they become depressed. So then they try out the other way. And this is where they're all just like frolicking under the moonlight and drinking and doing art and everybody's naked all the time and they're having a fucking great time. Their hearts are filled. But then the winter comes and they're fucked. So they, so, you know, this is like a very broad, like this is like the far flung extremes of, you know, this is a perfect, like a hemispheric example of the most extreme you could be if you only listen to one side of your brain, basically. And so... In the end, they they get they they go like to war again. There's all this carnage, but then there's tales of old of a a savior, um, which is balance, of course. So they achieve balance. Uh, again, forgive me for not like exactly knowing how this happens. I was smoking a blunt while listening to this. I didn't catch all the lyrics. There were parts where I was just fucking zoned into the music, man, and parts where I was confused by the music. Because let's be frank. 
like the long rush songs they they sometimes just have like you know a lot of musical passages that are i don't know if they're meant to be telling parts of the story without the vocals or if they're just like you know just to make the the song longer i don't fucking know there's parts that are just like they go on for a while and you don't really know why they're there but nonetheless other than that, they I guess they sound dope, but some of them don't sound as dope as others. So it's like, you know, there, some cutting could have been done. You didn't have to try to match the length of 2012, 2112, um, you know, but whatever. So nonetheless, it's still a great song. I'm, you know, apologies to the people who I know I'm, I'm like pissed off. Are like, no, man, I think the whole song is good. I, like, I fucking can sing every riff, dude. Uh, I'm sure I could do that. Like at some point in history. Um, so anyways, uh, the, the new God of balance is born Cygnus as described and, uh, the world comes together with an understanding of love, but there's something in particular about the way that the freedom is described where he, he, he describes everybody as alone and free, but also like that they can run alone and free but that everybody's in unity and everybody's work, like everybody's in understanding with one another. So this got me thinking about, well, I mean, I was already thinking about this because of course, after thinking about this song for even two seconds and uh, remembering even a quarter of what I just described, um, my thoughts immediately jumped to a recent video I had seen on YouTube from, I don't know, some bread tuber, no idea who it was, don't remember why I ended up on the video, but at the start, he's talking about Rush. Maybe it was about Rush. Maybe I clicked on it, but I was curious. I don't even remember. Um, but at the very start, I think he was just using them as like a, a metaphor for what he was going to talk about. But he's like, he's he, he, he basically says something like, I think praising one of their songs or lyrics, but then it's like, Oh yeah, man. Remember when, uh, I used to think Rush was cool. And then I found out they're like a bunch of libertarians. And, uh, I w and I was just found this to be an incredibly strange comment on a lot of levels, but like, that's like literally like the extent of what he had to say about it was like, yeah, I used to think Rush was good. Then I found out they're libertarian and now I don't like them anymore. Seemed to be like the full gist of his sentiment. And I was like, wow, I can't imagine having such a problem with somebody identifying as a libertarian because like I understand that the libertarian party in America uh, has some like real clowns in it. Like there are people who are like, they don't want to pay for roads. They, uh, what was the thing the guy was saying about the toaster? There was this one dude who was complaining about a fucking, I don't remember, man. Libertarians have said some weird shit in their party, but that's because like the libertarian party of America is like the most radically libertarian people in the world because America is a libertarian country. I think that most of the people here have more libertarian beliefs than most other countries, which is why we have a more libertarian system than most other countries. And particularly, you know, in the first world. And like, it's one of the things we're criticized for by a lot of people, including obviously bread tubers, because they want a more communist system. But like America has always been very much about my freedom. Like that's the core conceit of the country, essentially. But the funny thing about it is that we're not we're not extreme libertarians. We're not like the, you know, the people who are in the libertarian party, which is why they have no shot. What we really want is like people who are basically somewhat close to the parties we have, but not affiliated with them because the parties are corrupt and evil. Like it's not even really a matter of who the candidates are. Like, you know, if, if some of the candidates weren't affiliated with the democratic party, I'd probably, have more of a like belief in them, you know, or, or the other party who's, you know, they're both fucking deeply, deeply, deeply corrupt. And I mean, uh, as are just a lot of politicians in general, and I don't trust many of them, but like, it's not about the fact that they're not 
libertarian enough. It's that they are deeply authoritarian in a secretive and backwards way that the American public doesn't actually agree with, and they're getting away with it. Because our government uh, openly spies on us. And the guy who revealed that to us, who is basically treated by the public as a hero, is currently in hiding in Russia. You know, writing bestsellers in the USA from uh, somewhere in hiding. Um, you know, where you know whistleblowers who reveal evil things our government is doing are dying in prison. Such as Julian Assange, where you know, the government is doing mass cover-ups on pedophilia rings and fucking just, like, endless blackmail fucking alien shit, man. Satanic, weird, crazy alien shit. Literal fucking goat statues on Epstein's Island crazy fucking shit is what our government's doing. It is not a, like, dramatically libertarian thing to distrust the government and think they should fuck off and have less control over us, not because we don't think that regulation makes sense, but because these people are evil, not the inherently the system or the government as a concept, the people who are in control of our government. And, like, ousting them would be like, it would be a... It would take a lot. I mean, it would start with the alternative vote, which would be a big step. But then you would also just need to, like, really pump marketing into third parties. But, like, now's the time. We have the internet. You know, Yang came out of fucking nowhere and is still in the Democratic race as a non-politician just purely off internet hype. And people talk about him. And he's, you know, slowly becoming a household name who maybe has a chance in the future. I don't know. Maybe he'll run independent and say, fuck the Democratic Party. Holy shit. That would be so fucking cool. But I don't know. I don't know how doable anybody considers that at this point in time, you know. Um, but in any case, god damn, I'm getting fucking, I'm going in all directions today. This is truly a whirling, whirling dervish. So anyways, all of that is irrelevant because Rush is Canadian. So I don't even know what the libertarians are like in Canada. Uh, but like broadly... What Rush seems to want, going by the song Hemispheres, is just everybody to be at peace with each other and not fuck with each other, which is basically the libertarian endgame and why, I, why I'm why i willing to consider myself a libertarian is because that's my endgame. That's what I want for humanity. Peace and love everywhere, tranquility, nobody fucks with each other, you know? Just uh, do whatever you want. Just, uh, li you know, don't fuck with other people um, and just uh, live in a, a, a... All you need is a modest house in a modest neighborhood in a modest town where honest people dwell. Anyway, so that's what I get out of this, this Rush song in particular. And I feel like that's a very reasonable sentiment nobody would really have a huge problem with. Um, you know, obviously it's a fantastical fable that has, like, no real application to actual, like, current politics. It's just, like, a, a frame of mind. It's an endgame speculation. It's a wouldn't it be nice, you know, just like the, the vision that the main character has of a future society that could have been in 2112, you know, that unfortunately isn't because of an evil authority. First of all, if you didn't realize that fucking Rush were libertarians when you heard 2112, which is a traditional dystopian anti-authority story, I mean, what the fuck? Like, that's literally what any dystopia is libertarian propaganda. Just out and out. You know, as well it should be. Anyway, uh, fucking hell. So, in the song The Trees, this is the one. This is the one where I will actually criticize Rush for, for presenting a fable so simplistic that it has no application to reality. Because the song The Trees goes, There is unrest in the forest, there is trouble with the trees. For the maples want more sunlight, and the oaks ignore their pleas. So the trouble with the maples, and they're quite convinced they're right, is that the oaks are just too lofty, and they grab up all the light. 
But the oaks can't help their feelings if they like the way they're made, and they wonder why the maples can't be happy in their shade. So, at this point, I'm wondering, do they consider the oaks to be evil in this scenario? I, I have to wonder, like, are we meant to be seeing these two as, uh, as equally vile? Because the oaks are just like, deal with it. Be in the fucking shade, bitch. Um, you know, but the maples are like, like the way that they, that he says, they can't help their feelings. They like the way they're made. It's very defensive, right? Like, doesn't it seem like he's kind of saying like, well, the oaks can't help it if they're tall. Why don't you just be happy in the shade? Like, I don't know if that's just supposed to be how the oaks are defending themselves. Or is he implying that the oaks are right to think that the maples should just be happy in their shade because they need sunlight to live. That's how trees work. So in this metaphor, you're like, are you, are you, uh, are the oaks supposed to be bad guys or not? It's not clear to me. And honestly, it would change. I mean, it would radically shift my opinion one, you know, if I figured out one way or the other, because if he's saying the oaks can't help their feelings, they like the way they're made and they wonder why the maples can't be happy in their shade. Is that just a, you know, is that just a description of how the oaks are feeling or is it a defense of how the oaks are feeling, you know? Anyways, it continues. There is unrest in the forest, and the creatures have all fled. Um, as the maples scream oppression, and the oaks just shake their heads. And then finally... Um, fuck. I can't remember all the lyrics. But at the end, the maples form a union, and they cast an open law... And the trees are all kept equal by hatchet, axe, and saw. So in the end, the maples are the ones who, you know, they decide that, you know what, we're going to do the authoritarian thing and make everybody have to be equal, but they do so by cutting everybody down. So clearly that's a negative circumstance one way or another however we interpret this whether we're meant to think that the oaks were being bastards and not compromising or if the maples were just being completely fucking unreasonable either way we definitely don't want an ending where everybody gets chopped down to the same level and uh you know i i think that I mean, this is like a very obvious metaphor for communism, basically, right? Everybody has to be equal, uh, but by way of the people who have, you know, by ev everybody giving something up, essentially. Um, and on such broad terms and in such a dramatic fashion, yeah, obviously not good. It's a very, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a, it's a metaphor that cuts right to the heart, doesn't it? You just picture in your head all those fucking cut down trees and you're like, I don't fucking want that. That's a bad forest, shit forest, you know? But the point of the song should be that the reason everybody got cut down is because they never came to an agreement and that this is what will inevitably happen if the oaks just shake their heads and don't do anything. Like, I hope that's what the song means because ultimately, yeah, the the lack of compromise on both sides, it's like if you ignore the, the, the proletariat demanding, you know, that you give them what they want, they will cut you down. They will eventually, you know, overthrow you. And this is the regime they'll implement, I guess. It's communist revo revolution. But, uh, you know... I don't know if that's the way they were looking at it or if it's like the maples just took an unreasonable extreme when, you know, everybody would have been happier if they had just stayed where they were because there's no move in a forest. You know, they, can the, the oaks have, do they even have a choice? Is there anything they can do? You know, um, is that what they're trying to ask? Because obviously in real life, there are definitely things they can do. You know, the people, uh, the oaks of the world, they are not stationed in place. They're not affixed to the ground like the trees are. So this is why it's an interesting and troubled metaphor, but it's really into open to interpretation. I mean, when I was growing up, I always thought of it as that the oaks were being assholes. Like I thought that was the implication. It's just interesting to to think about the phrasing used and the the lack of really attacking the oaks in the way that the song kind of attacks the maples as as you know 
just describing them as like not listening to reason essentially you know and to think if the band is in fact like deeply libertarian maybe that's really how they feel but i mean uh you can take it however you want that's what makes art so great and why you can connect with it and why you're still quoting rush even though you know they're libertarians you're still thinking about their music so shut the fuck up and listen to it you fucking asshole i love being self-employed even though it has lots of problems because there's nobody looking out for you. You, you have to file your own taxes. You're a contractor. You don't get any benefits, uh, automatically. I mean, granted, if you can afford those things, if you can just, you know, afford to buy, uh, healthcare and different stuff like that, and you want to have those things, then there's no reason you can't, if you are successful enough as a, uh, as a sole proprietor, which I basically am. I d actually don't have health care currently, but, uh, you know, I will probably get it before too very long, and I could probably afford it. Maybe I'd have to cut down on smoking so much pot all the time, but, you know, <gasps> obviously I don't want to do that. So, point being that... I like being self-employed because I set all the parameters of my own career. I do everything in the order I want to do it. I am my only supervisor. And granted, I do make most of my money through donation. So, you know, and, and I and through appeasing my fans via, like, making content that they want to see so that they will continue to watch my videos. Like, even if I was completely ad uh, based and you know and made stuff that got sponsorships and shit like that i would still have to you know please somebody in order for my job to be done but uh you know whether or not i decide to you know like worry about doing that um you know is completely on me so like i can sit here and say like okay I want to really make the fans happy, so I'm going to do this, but I can also say, I don't give a fuck about the fans, I'm going to do what's good for me, even if I lose money, you know? I can make those decisions for myself, because there is no corporate structure surrounding me, I am not indebted to anybody else. And, you know, I think it's, it's really fascinating the way that people talk about business, the way that people talk about... Uh, you know, corporations, there's this idea that like in a, in a capitalist society, any like corporate entity of any kind has to like in inherently has to continually chase growth that they have to constantly have higher profit margins than they did before when this is just not true. I mean, constantly corporations are resizing and, you know, uh, like having to, you know, to downsize in order to keep alive. Now, granted, they will have to lose a lot of people in that process, but it just means that they, you know, uh, they couldn't afford to have the size that they have anymore and stay alive. Um, you know, and it, it could be that the CEOs have overstuffed salaries and they can't hold on to employees. But I mean, like something like that, I don't know. It should eventually weed that company out, you know, like uh, companies that suck to work for, um, you know, they, they burn through employees really quickly. And so they, they have their own problems, you know, of having to deal with constant employee turnover. But there's just, just so many different structures of how business can be done. And I do not disagree that the tendency is to favor constant growth. But, like, you know, only, like, large Wall Street traded corporations are really, like, that concerned about doing that, you know? Like, if, if there's not stockholders, if there's not shareholders, there's nobody really holding you to this idea that you need to... Uh, constantly grow and moreover it's not as though people can't have value in a stock that you know just grows in a in accordance with the uh, inflation rate because it's basically just like a place to put your money you know for safekeeping like maybe this co company will do better th with my money than I will you know and, and uh, I will always have this as like a bank I don't think that's a, a service that's as reliable as most banks are then again not all banks are reliable would my money have ever been safer in a bank than it would have been in Nintendo stock at any point in history I don't know 
Now that I'm thinking about it, I, you know, I've been thinking about buying Nintendo stock for a long time, but now that I just said that out loud, although I have a great bank, so I'm not that worried. Point being, I, as a sole business, am not beholden to constant growth. And I think that you can have arrangements with people uh, who you're working with where there's an understanding that the, there is not a, uh, a nest, like that it will not always be in the company's best interest to be seeking growth, you know, that, uh, you know, we should always run the company to best suit the needs of the people working there. <clears throat> and I think that seems to be the mentality of a lot of Japanese companies. I mean, we see how it can cause problems if a if a publisher or something or, uh, you know, a company just like tries to do more than it can. Um, and they just, you know, fold under the, the, the weight of the way they do things. But you look at the best run studios in Japan, like Kyoto Animation, you know, before the fire, uh, and UFO Table, well, before, you know, recent years. And you just look at these studios that, you know, at some point in time were considered to be extremely well run. And it seems as though they were, they were not chasing growth or expansion they're tracing just you know the people who are there having a consistent good job that they enjoy doing that you know leads to good products that people enjoy consuming and uh nintendo is another good example like the fact that this company has not tried to grow explosively like i think that's part of the reason that nintendo was so technologically limited over the the wii's generation is that nintendo themselves as a first party developer is not a super massive company and sony and microsoft <coughs> are not concerned about first party development nintendo doesn't want to have to develop you know, a Mario game that looks like a PS4 game, you know, or PS3 at the time uh, that the Wii came out. So I really think that they just, they were thinking of it from their own perspective of like, what are we going to make, you know? And uh, for a company of that size, it makes more sense to make innovative things that take fewer people than, you know, something that takes a, a massive team. And this is also why we've run into problems. I think this is pretty much the reason why Pokemon Sword and Shield, uh, it is the lumpy experience that it is, is uh, that this small team, who normally is enough to tackle a Pokemon game and has even been able to tackle 3DS games, uh, just making the move to the Switch, uh, possibly midway through development, possibly not expecting that they were going to be making a Switch game, probably is why... That like then you know they needed to take another year off or something, but I think they just knew that they could get the game to enough and and and, and that it wouldn't matter because they know it's gonna sell anyways. So like you know, I, I, personally, I'm open to forgiveness if the next game just blows that one out of the water and is just like the the real shit that you know we want. But who knows what the future holds? But still, uh, we're talking about how these companies. You know, people talk about how if Pokemon is one of, like, the best-selling franchises in the world and Game Freak has, par uh, you know, partial ownership of it, could they not hire more people to work on this game? And it's like, well, it's not so simple as to just, like, I mean, what are they going to do? Uh, hire contractors? Like, if, if the goal is to get this out within this three-year time, it's not like they can train a bunch of new employees to work at the studio and, like, build a new building and expand in a proper way and train all these people to be at the same level of the people who already work there, who have been working on the series for, you know, some time. <clears throat> who have been briefed, you know, if they add more people to it, it's just going to be contractors and that work is not going to be as good. That's why all these major productions that have to do that run into so many problems. Like if you, you know, if you've seen Shirobako, like you understand how, like when they had to subcontract to these other studios that were just, you know, whoever they could get and they sucked, then it puts them in a bind and it makes the show that they're putting all this effort into suddenly look like tr shit, you know? So, like, you really got to come at it from a, a lot of different angles when you think about, like, the idea of expansion. And for me, as a YouTuber, expansion is weird because it's almost like a lever you can pull, but you, you have to hold it down if you will like uh you know i'm imagining one of those bamboo water pipes waterways and there's like a you know a rope string 
Like imagine like an aqueduct made of bamboo and there's a rope string hanging from it. And if you pull down on the string, the bamboo will come down and allow it'll it'll start pouring water down on onto you. You will have sweet life giving water. But you if you want the stream to keep going, you have to hold the string and it'll just dump water on you. Or if you decide that you're not that thirsty, you can let go of the string and just pull on it whenever you want. And what this metaphor is trying to describe is how on YouTube, the methods for how to be successful are very obvious. There's certain types of formulas of content, certain subject matters that are just like always going to be winners. And you can definitely go into that pool and just do that. And it doesn't have to be like soulless. Like there's certain niches that if you are doing it well, you have a ton of personality and you really know your shit, you can, you know, it doesn't matter that like it's not, you know, uh, purely art created from the depth of your mind or whatever like you're doing something interesting i would like a perfect example of a person like this it would be steve 1989 mre info that guy he just reviews military rations um from all throughout history but like the way he does it is super interesting like the format of his videos is really good his personality the way the the level of knowledge he has on the subject his ability to review food um you know the entertaining way that he films it even though it's all just in his room like everything about the videos is exactly what it should be you know and when you watch it you just think this is i don't even care about mres i want to watch this guy review mres because you know, this is like a, a way to learn about a thing that's interesting and be entertained at the same time. So like, you know, you could do something like that. Um, and if you do it consistently and it's something that enough people are interested in, then you have a case like him where all of his videos get fuck tons of views because there's just a lot of people who are interested in military rations and the videos are good. So there's no need to go anywhere else for this. You know, like you've got, he's got such a strong personality. It makes you want to watch those videos. And then there's plenty of stuff that doesn't have as much personality. And it's a lot harder to, to grow a channel in a, in a place where there's already tons of people covering it. Like it would be really difficult to start a new gaming analysis channel unless you have a strong gimmick. And I really watched, uh, this this uh, this sort of sad tale play out for myself where um, me and Tom launched the I Am Games channel. And the idea of this channel was that Tom would play through games while he was live streaming and uh, I would watch. I would then write an analysis on the game based on like what I saw and what he told me about it and then um, have him voice it. I edit it and we post it, and it basically was just a way to expedite the parts of the process that each of us, uh, you know, were not as good at, basically, like, so the videos were convincing, people didn't even immediately assume that I had written, you know, the ones that he voiced in, um, and, like, it was, you know, I, I thought pretty good game analysis, you know, solid, decent analysis on recent games. The same stuff as the stuff that is popular. Probably done better than a lot of the stuff that is popular, but this is such a, like, split hair. There's not anything that unique about the channel, and in fact, the title was kind of deliberately meant to be, like, as broad-reaching as possible. Like, I Am Games. It's, like, a very generic name, but it's so, like, ridiculous-sounding that we thought that maybe that would draw attention to it, and it seemed to work when we first put it on a t-shirt and sold the I Am Games shirts. But another channel came out around the same time, with kind of the same concept, except that it was girlfriend reviews. And it was a girl who watched her boyfriend play games and then reviewed them based on what she saw. And it was more comedy focused. And really, it's the fact that the whole gimmick is that it's not like from a game analyst perspective, not from a serious reviewer, but from the perspective of somebody who doesn't know as much that was the appeal. Like, it was the subversiveness that made this one popular. And you really have to be at, like, a, a certain saturation point within a genre for, you know, something that's completely subverting the idea of it to be the one that gets popular. So it kind of put me in a position of realizing, like, man, breaking through into games, it's 
it's not just a matter of talking about whatever the most popular game is. You have to have a really unique angle. You need to either have a title that says, like, I have a really unique take on this game that nobody else has. And even if, if that's the case, it needs to be an eye-grabbing take. You need to have a real striking take that's going to really make people go, wow, that's your take? You know, this is kind of like what MatPat, I think, did with Game Theory was like, you know, it, it was mostly about applying some really ridiculous sounding statement to a popular video game, you know, in order to draw your attention and then sort of justifying it by saying, oh, well, it's like a weird theory I'm crafting about the science uh, as applied to this game, you know. But uh, otherwise, if you have like, let's say, a five hour review, that would be a unique take on a game, you know. But, like, just trying to grow a standard, like, game analysis channel, it's, like, even if you're doing something good, people don't know that. Nobody can tell by looking at it. You have to be really standout if you want to be growing. Whereas, in somewhere like the anime field, um, you know, there's not tons of big channels. And if you have a unique take on a popular show, there's a chance that your video will blow up just because nobody else is talking about that show. Like, there's there's a lot of gaps, even within, like, a decent number of pretty large YouTubers. Anime sneaks up on you sometimes. Sometimes shows get popular out of nowhere. Sometimes you happen to be the person who is right on the best take, right, you know, in the pulse of the moment, and you propelled it forward. And, like, there's a lot of right place, right time involved with being successful on YouTube. You really have to be able to read the trends, see the tide, or just be in the zeitgeist yourself, you know? I mean, obviously, the best way to be feeling the same way that everyone else is feeling is to be doing the same thing that everyone else is doing. So if you're just keeping up with the current shows naturally and you happen to be the first person to talk about the crazy shit that just went down, you might be the person who's going to blow up before even the bigger names get to it. Or when they do get to it, it might boost your numbers because you show up in the related videos. So you can kind of dip into the well with anime, as I mean, so like with, with video games, like, uh, you know, if you just cover the latest, biggest thing that everybody else is covering, you're lost in the shuffle. There's a chance you could be the first person to talk about some kind of indie darling um, and I, you know, there was a time in I Am Games where I was close to b doing that with CrossCode, and, uh, you know, there was, like, one other video that had no views, and I was like, I'll make a big ol' analysis out of it, and maybe people will care. I never ended up doing it because the game was so long, I couldn't beat it in time for its relevance in my mind. Um, but then somebody else did the exact thing I was planning to do and had a huge success with it, and I was like, well, you know, there you go. That's the exact tide that I that was the place where I was picking up my surfboard but then I thought that wave had already passed me by turns out it just wasn't done building yet you know but in any case you you really got to be you know keeping track of what's going on watching the waves as it were I talked about that in a, in a video uh, towards the end of last year but um, you know, you also can create your own waves if you are somebody who, you know, has the ability to just make a splash with your own content, your own personality, you know, not even having to talk about other things or making something, you know, newly controversial in a way that it wasn't before, you know, like something like my, uh, uh, most boring taste in anime video is definitely a making waves video. You know, there was no waves about this thing until I made waves about it. So like, you know, you can, you can create waves. Sometimes that amounts to, you know, being an asshole and creating drama, but it could also just mean that you're investigating stuff. You're figuring out, uh, what people haven't uncovered, you know, surprising people with information they didn't know they wanted to know. Um, and just, you know, all kinds of things like that. And I, I think I've done a lot of that over the course of my career as well. So, like, if you want waves, you gotta be looking for the place, either, you know, surfing in a place where there are waves, or, uh, you know, figuring out how you are going to, like, what kind of cannonball you're gonna drop of what scale to make waves. But, like, making waves is a good way to draw attention to yourself, keep yourself relevant. It's a good way to, you know, get the waters shaken up in the community a little bit, you know? Get things moving, maybe upset the order of things so that you have an opportunity to climb higher on the ladder. Uh, but, you know, 
if you don't really care about doing all that, if you're not trying to create a big wave, you can settle in the waters for a while and, you know, be comfortable in the spot that you happen to be in. Bask in the sun on top of your board and just get a nice tan, you know, get a nice tan that'll last you all the way through the winter into the next summer. And, uh, you know, you can chill up on that board for a while, but then it might be like, oh shit, the water's getting cold. I gotta fucking, I gotta do something. I gotta warm it up. I gotta stir the pot. And you could turn on little warmers, you know, maybe you just want, maybe you just want it to keep it warm for a while. Maybe you're just going to slip a little heating pad under there and you can recharge it every so often, you know, but eventually you got to buy a new heating pad or you got to fucking, you know, create new waves. You got to shake things up again. Maybe you're bored of this spot. We're going to go under the bridge this time, you know, so, but boosh, you got to drop some bombs. But, you know, if the waters settle, it takes a lot more to get the ocean going again. And especially on YouTube where your viewer retention is everything. And it's, it's really, I don't think YouTube is even gives a fuck about the view counts at this point. Cause when you go into the new studio, the new analytics, it tells you watch time first and foremost, it doesn't even tell you about views. And that's because how much money you make has way more to do with watch time. And this is why content has already been profitable because, uh, well, I guess I haven't calculated the, you know, the cost that's gone into content's operation so far to, to calculate whether it's profitable, but like it's made, it made money in its first month, uh, you know, to an extent where it could be sent to us, um, right away. And the, the reason for that is that even though the view counts are low on the videos, they do have ad breaks and they are long as fuck. And the CPM, the, the amount you make per view of ad goes up the more time people spend watching. So if you have a long video, like this is how red letter media has so much money, you know, beyond their Patreon that they have these very long videos with one or two ad breaks in them. And it's almost like each ad is even more valuable than the last. Cause you kept these people around for so fucking long on YouTube, turning them into people who are on YouTube. And so YouTube really values the playlist. You might have noticed they have this, uh, the watch later feature that they're really pushing. It's like on all the thumbnails now. It's very easy to accidentally click, but they want you to build a playlist. They want you to grab a bunch of videos you want to see, make a playlist and watch it all day. They want you to, you know, consume YouTube the way you consume Netflix, which is just in a mindless fucking haze. And the only way that you can, as one creator, cause people to do that is through either you know, massively successful videos of decent length, like say 10 minute video, but it's got a million views. That's a lot of watch time between all the different people who are watching it. Uh, but, um, you know, no individual view is worth as much as if you have a uh, hundred thousand people watching a video that's an hour long with three ad breaks in it will make vastly more money. I think even than that, that 10 minute video, just because of those ad breaks, you know, um, I don't know. I'd have to do the, the math on that. I don't know exactly what each would be worth, but you know, it, it would be, it's just like you can use any of these methods to, you know, to achieve success through YouTube's metric, um, and to keep, people paying attention to you. However, you know, people don't want to always just, they don't always want what they consume to be something lukewarm, just meant to fill time. They want it to also have things that they can rewatch, that they'll remember, that they'll share with people. You know, you, you, you need a balance of like spicier and milder content really to survive on YouTube. Um, unless you can somehow be spicy all the time, which is, I think with like Mr. Beast has found that that way of just like his his mode of thought on what to do for a YouTube video is what can I do that will get your attention every time you know um, just because he he can and that's that's the whole modus operandi of the channel it has no real other you know meaning beyond that but uh but anyways so my ability to control when I you know, do or don't want to make waves when I do or don't want to, you know, try to really put myself on the grind for making more money or put myself on the grind for making stuff that I really want to, or, you know, creating uh, new revenue streams or just doing different things about my channel. Like just, I really have a lot of control 
a staggering amount of control over my job. And the way I look at it, it's the reason that I that I care about having things that way is that like I I I see my art as a part of me, you know, and it's like my art and myself are are intrinsically intertwined. I don't want to do my art for other people. I don't want to do, you know, I don't I don't want to make things because uh, or or work because of the fact that other people need me to work. I want to work because I want to work. I want to work because it's it's my desire is to create something and uh you know or do something and there's there's no other reason. It's just that I want to do it. It might be that I want to do it because I want money. You know, like if say, uh, let's say doing my rants, I don't always want to do rants about things that people want me to rant about, but I do want to make money. And this is a way that I am willing to make money, you know, but like I only do it when I want to. I don't do it if I don't want to. If I didn't want to do it, I would cut the tier out of my Patreon and it wouldn't be there anymore. You know, I would find a different way. I I will only do things like, I mean, all of the tiers are things I made up. You know, I'm not beholden to any of these tiers existing. I have canceled tiers plenty of times before. I've had ones where I just, you know, the reward tier just didn't work out. And so I just killed it after like a month or two because I was like, ah, this isn't something I want to do. Thought I did. Don't actually, you know. Um, so, you know, with all that self-control, it's like, I never have to make things that I don't want to make, and I never have to do things that I don't want to do. And I think about what it means to, like, work for somebody else, and to, especially in the arts, to have a job like mine, where you are, you know, giving away your whatever creativity you have, you're using it in service of somebody else. And it really makes me think that it's kind of like letting somebody fuck your wife. It's like if you are signing a a contract or you're, you're, you know, using your work for somebody else's purposes, you know, in, in my mind, at least I view my, my creativity, you know, as this, as this other side of myself that is almost, you know, standing in equal to myself, you know, like the, the things that I create, they speak for me and therefore they must represent me. And so if they are being used for something else, if they're being used in, in service of something, you know, um, then it's basically like I'm giving myself up to that thing. And, and granted, you know, let's say that you're in a band and there's four musicians and you're all kind of, you know, creating a, a creative compromise of sorts in the middle, but it's it's basically like having a big orgy, you know? It's all consensual. Everybody wants to be there. Everybody is... Nobody's, like, sacrificing what they want to do because they think that, uh, you know, they, they are being, like, held down by the rest. I mean, maybe they are if, it, if it's a negative situation, but ideally, everybody is just doing what they think will lead to the best result, you know, because they think the result of what all of them are doing together is greater than what they can do individually. Or, uh, you know, not even that it's greater, but that it's a different experience, which is equally valuable, you know. So it, it's like you, you, you know, you're working together and that is like a more of a shared experience, but it's like... If you are, let's say, uh, you know, you have an idea for a movie and you sell it to a studio and they tell you, oh, we're going to do this and this to it because we think that's what audiences will react to better. We're going to change the ending. Um, You know, here's who we're going to cast. And, you know, you don't get a say in it. Like you have basically just given them your wife. And they're just going to do whatever they want with her. You know, like you are not, this is not a a group activity. This is not multi-love. You've just been, you've just been cucked, you know? And I, I think that tons and tons of people fall into the trap of, you know, letting themselves get fucked because it's not your wife actually who you're, you're giving away. It's you. You're giving yourself to these companies. You are the one getting fucked. You know, you're giving away 
the 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 inner wife inside of you which is you so you are letting yourself get fucked you know uh un uncovered unprotected in the ass uh and you gotta be you can't let it happen you know you just can't let them take advantage of you you can't let uh, you know, corporations and and people with contracts and anybody who who just wants to take advantage of what you have and use it to their benefit, you know, and they'll tell you that it benefits you just as much as them. But a lot of the time it benefits them more than you and they don't really have your back. Now, granted, again, uh, much like, you know, being with a band, there's plenty of record labels out there that are great. You know, there's plenty of people who, uh, there's plenty of game publishers who are great. There's plenty of people in the industry who you do want to work for, but you really have to know who those people are. You really got to know that you're going to work for somewhere that is good. And if you can't get a job at one of those places, if you can only get a job at the place that isn't good, I really don't think you should do it. I know that your options are limited, but there's there's got to be a way there i mean there is a way there is a way that you can work for yourself work for people who you can trust at least work in an environment that you know is a good work environment like people think about the job they think about like oh i don't want to do this job fuck the job the work environment i know you want to do animation but animation is a bad work environment. You will be happier if you work in a good work environment and do animation on the side on your own. And then you will not have to bastardize what you do or just be, you know, beholden to other people's visions. You can come up with your own shit and, you know, let your own imagination run wild and and, you know, try to build something of your own, whether that becomes a career or not. Maybe not. Maybe you will just be happy working jobs that don't suck and having time to be creative in your own time. But, you know, if you're not getting a good fuck, don't sleep with them. That's it for this whirling dervish. I'm sorry, these they, they always take longer to come out because, yeah, I have plenty of shit that I think about, man, but most of it just makes me sad, not excited. And, oh, I'll actually continue on to another topic that I wanted to bring up that I almost forgot, um, which is that this thing I just did, this dervish that I just went on, um, which I'm very happy with, like, it could have been a scripted video. It could have just as easily been a written, edited video with clips from the songs, uh, you know, actual on-screen lyrics, and it probably could have done fairly well because Rush is a popular band and this is a popular album, but it would have taken days to do, to write the whole script, do the voiceover and edit, and I don't want to fucking do that. I don't want to. Uh, and I, I want to talk about this because my content has definitely shifted and there's a lot of comments I get these days that are like, uh, you know, you never make fucking real videos, your video, your content sucks. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, that's the trade-off I made. Like if, if it wasn't evident, if you're somehow holding on to an idea that this is not how the way things are, I have sacrificed having the highest possible quality content for having frequent content of a relatively high quality compared to other like content. Because... You have to understand that you might not, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, obviously you're not one of the people I'm talking about, but if somebody who only watches like, you know, the anime videos, the main anime videos, um, who they, first of all, not likely a patron, but even if they are, um, like putting the level of effort that it takes into making the putting into them the level of effort that it takes to make them like high quality edited videos the rate that i can accomplish that at or to hire somebody to help me accomplish it at is not high enough to maintain an audience who seeks that content whereas i can sustain an audience making frequent content 
that is of a higher quality than like content. And personally, that's the kind of content that I would most appreciate and want to follow because it's most of what I consume. So to describe what I mean, I watch Anthony Fantano every fucking day. The man just vlogs. He's one of the most, you know, he's, he's got 2 million subscribers now. He's the biggest u- music reviewer uh, in the world. He is the biggest music reviewer, but he's a vlogger. They're edited vlogs, you know, they're, they're quick. He writes out, I think they, I think he said that he has like almost full scripts and he definitely does multiple takes so that his delivery is good and energetic and flows well. You know, uh, he does little editing gimmicks here and there and flourishes on the videos to keep them entertaining, but it's very minimal. It's the fact that he puts them out every fucking day and he covers every fucking album and you really believe in his taste and you really get a sense of what he, you know, what he thinks of music and you can perfectly understand from one of his reviews what you're getting yourself into, essentially. And, you know, uh, he reasonably often recommends great albums. I've discovered uh, most of the great albums I discover are from Fantano. Not even gonna lie. I'm a total Fantano fucking drone. Not that I agree with his opinions. I usually like stuff he gave lower scores to. Doesn't matter. He posts one every day, so I'm aware of a lot of albums. So, I'm in the Anthony Fantano infrastructure. I, I use him for more purposes than just to entertain myself with YouTube videos. I throw him on as background noise in the morning or when I'm not paying attention. I usually have him on a second monitor. I don't pay attention to most of the reviews unless they're about albums I actually care about or artists I'm already familiar with. <clears throat> just like most people. And a lot of people probably don't even watch all of his videos. I watch them all because I want to know what albums are coming out and because I have plenty of you know time to fill dead air with. So... I just, I will consume anything he makes, basically, um, and I have tons of respect for him. He's extremely hardworking, he's, <clears throat> you know, he's done a ton for me as a, as a fan, and he's had me on his podcast and stuff, so, you know, I'm also friendly with him, but, uh, Fantano doesn't make great videos. There's no Fantano video individually that I would put on my best videos of the decade list. Some of them are more memorable or entertaining than others. Some of them are, you know, some of them are actually, you know, there's a few of his like standard reviews where he kind of really tries to make it something special. If it's like a zero star review, you know, or an in-depth analytical look at a Kendrick Lamar album or something. I appreciate that. But still, like... It's not what I'm thinking of when I think of, like, great YouTube content, but he is great as a YouTube content creator. It's the the whole is so much larger than the sum of its parts, you know? Um, and those parts are fucking, there's just a billion parts as well. And that's kind of how I think the people who really care about my content feel about me. Like, the people who patron me, the people who listen to all my stuff, they see it as, like, this is a better podcast than any other podcast I listen to. This is just my favorite podcast. It's it's not that a podcast even has the potential to be as great or as memorable as... I mean, it, maybe it does, but it's rare that a podcast will achieve the highs that a fully fucking scripted, edited, planned video can achieve. A film, you know, that a film can achieve. Um, which is the highest level of quote-unquote video. Um, it's hard to imagine a podcast achieving that level without just the, the, those, those spark pop moments that fucking stick with you because they're so magnetic and, and just such a product of that unique circumstance. And I really do think that a big part of putting out frequent content is, uh, basically running around outside with a lightning rod, you know, just, uh, just stabbing rods into the ground, waiting for one of them to get hit because something is, something exciting is going to happen if you fucking throw enough darts at a wall, you know, but, uh, I really think that, yeah, like, the point of my content is for it to be more frequent, and I, for a long time, kind of didn't even really see it that way. Like, I used to see my Patreon as giving me the excuse to work on longer videos, and I pretty much advertised it that way for a long time, you know? Like, the idea was always like, oh, if I make enough that I can spend a whole month on one video, I'll be able to get done all these gigantic video projects. Um, but then I started doing that and people didn't like it. 
people saw the content as declining, mostly just because it's coming out slower. The videos took longer to make, you know, and people were, uh, granted, I would also be putting out lots of other content alongside those videos on my side channel, but I think that people looked at it as like, oh, uh, he's, you know, he's, like, the thing is, all that other side content was tiny and didn't take the kind of, like, I used to put out four fully edited videos a month. So each one of those took an equal amount of effort about a week, you know? If you make one video that takes the editor a month to do, then, or even takes me a month to do if I'm the editor, then that means that, like, all I have time for while I'm doing that is other small videos. And that's the model right now. That's how I've been doing it. Every month or a couple of months, I get some kind of big edited video. But, like, for the most part, I'm putting out tons of other shit, you know, tons of vlogs, podcasts, let's plays, whatever the fuck, uh, and even just smaller edited pieces or smaller written pieces. And I really want to get more into just like writing scripts and reading them on camera because I've always been limited by this idea that, you know, uh, a scripted video means an edited video because I don't want to have to, um, you know, have just all these constant breaks where I had to edit Every time I flubbed the script, you know, I don't like that, uh, the constant jump, jump cut feel for a script being read. But after like watching Don Jolly, who will basically just, you know, he doesn't edit any of the mistakes out. He just kind of plunges through them, you know, and his videos are great. And I, he's one of my favorite YouTubers. So, you know, looking at that, I was like, I really should just write more scripts and just read them into the camera because, it's not only not really in my nature to do those longer projects because I have way too many ideas, but also it's not really what my audience seems to want because my Patreon f fell when I wasn't, you know, when I wasn't putting out those kinds of videos. And it's funny because you could look at it that things aren't that different now from how they were at that time when that fall happened because it's still kind of a jumble of bigger edited content and smaller stuff. But, like, the smaller stuff I've put a lot more effort into. And I think people who are really paying attention probably feel that in things like the Whirling Dervish podcast, <clears throat> things like content where there's more of a structure, there's more of a clear point and goal. We're talking about subjects that should interest people. It's not just like whatever random thing I felt like, let's fucking just podcast about Pokemon movies. People will care automatically, you know, like it's, it, it, there's more thought put into it, but it's, and that's exactly what I think is the key is like deciding how important is this idea that I'm having, you know, because this rush idea, like when I pictured it as that fully edited video, I was like, that would be such a good video. It would get so many views, but I don't want to do it. Like I will have other ideas. There's other things I'm working on right now that I want to do that. I have a ton of backed up shit. I have tons of Patreon. I'm fucking, I'm steeped in the mire. I ain't got time for new projects. I basically wrote out like a, a plan for January. Nothing is getting added to that. If any new ideas are formed, they will be podcasts or fucking scripted vlogs. That is the breaks. Sorry to anybody who doesn't enjoy that type of content, but I know you guys do. Pantsu, do you have anything you want to say before we log off? I gotta poop. Holy shit. <laughs>